Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Adin Deki, a board member of SAF. I would like I would like to welcome you all to our event. The support to support our people and our kids and support our nation here to set our nation in United States too from the terrorists. Um, it's a message from our kids' heart to American heart. Please tell your government, tell United States government and senators and president, stop the terrorists and supporting terrorists in Syria. Enough. Our kids, they have dream and we want their dream to come true. We want the smile on their face again. <coughs> we want to take their tears from their eyes and the sadness from their heart. Please help us. Please put pressure on the government and the Congress and senators and the White House by calls, by sign our petition, by calls the White House. Please, we need your support. Each call save Syrian kids' life and bring the happiness in our in our country and defend the United States, our nation, from the terrorists. Excuse me, I want to speak in Arabic. So I welcome our ambassador, our man who defend our country. We don't just love him, we respect him and love him from our heart. And each Syrian pray to Mr. Jafari, God bless him because he supported us and he fought to keep, to bring peace to our country. Mr. Khair, Dr. Jafari. Ahla wa sahla alila, nisr Syria. Be'lubna, min habbak, mnitmanna daiman, inda nkoon anna alwaqt, lana qdan riddillak iddain, li alak taftan, u be'lubna alak, innak hamayt baladna, dafaat anna, bikil daiqa, bi alp al-umam al-tahda. Tfaddal. Thank you so much. Thank you, Avin, and thanks for this distinguished audience for coming uh, at, this, at this very uh, hot moment of the afternoon to show some solidarity with uh, Syria and the Syrian people. We are grateful to all of you, the anti-war movement, namely speaking, the SAF, Syrian American Forum, and all these noble and lofty American people who decided to share with us today in the morning briefing at the UN, as well as right now at the church center here, uh, who decided to come and share with us these uh, important moments of solidarity with Syria and the Syrian people. We are grateful to all of you and I'm, I'm specifically grateful to this uh, distinguished panelist from the United States of America who were uh, who went to Syria willingly to witness the experience, the new experience actually, uh, the new electoral experience that Syria witnessed recently on June the 3rd for the presidential elections. These ladies and gentlemen came back with their own testimonies on the process of the organization of these presidential elections. They witnessed, they presented their witnesses and their testi testimonies this morning at the United Nations Center for, uh, for Information. And now they are uh, again uh, uh, 
uh, are willing to share the same kind of experience with uh, this uh, uh, noble and lofty uh, uh, audience. Syria is a victim of accumulation of some factors, some elements. Syria is a victim of terrorism, of course, but Syria is also a victim of miscalculation by heavyweight statesmen in USA and elsewhere. Syria is a victim of misleading information and misreading of the geopolitical landscape prevailing in our area. This combination of too many elements brought up a catastrophe not only for the Syrian people, but also for the interest of the American people, for the interest of United States of America. It's somehow awkward to see that while we are fighting terrorism in Syria, some people in the United States, but also in the Gulf states, in, the, in Turkey and elsewhere, describe the same terrorists as revolutionaries, as jihadists, as militants, as insurgents, or in the best cases, they call them Sunni rebels. to play the card of, to, to play the sectarian and confessional cards uh, into this uh, crisis. Fighting terrorism in Syria means fighting terrorism in USA, in Europe, in Russia, in China, and elsewhere. Terrorists have no religion, have no nationality, have no race, have no values whatsoever, according to the United Nations General Assembly strategy to combat terrorism, for combating terrorism. This is a common denominator agreed upon by all member states of the United Nations. But still, the way people look at who is terrorist and who is not creates this big discrepancy between the theory and the practice. So I think that uh, our main task should be to aware, to create some kind of awareness among the uh, public opinion on the real identity of terrorism. I feel disturbed, personally speaking, when I read the New York Times headlines every morning and I see that ISIS, Daesh, is called militants or fighters. In the best cases, they call them cross-border fighters or foreign fighters. So you see how many terms did I use so far? None of them, none of them describes uh, Daesh or ISIS as terrorists. They turn around so that they avoid describing these terrorists the way they deserve it. That means somehow, deep inside themselves, they are backing these terrorists. Those who do, who do not acknowledge these terrorists as terrorists, that means they are backing them, directly or indirectly. So this is why participating at rescuing the Syrian people from these 
barbarian waves of terrorists is in the interest of the United States of America and of the American people themselves. They started in Syria, they moved into Iraq, now they are creating branches elsewhere. They want to create a so-called Islamic Caliphate. They don't know what they want because they are being manipulated by foreign intelligence <coughs> services in order to create what they call, what one day Condoleezza Rice said, uh, describe it as creative chaos. The chaos should be creative. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a chaos. So what we are suffering from no nowadays in Syria and Iraq and elsewhere is exactly, is exactly the creative chaos that one day Condoleezza Rice talked about it after the invasion of Iraq. <coughs> I would like to conclude by saying that we shouldn't fall in this trap of focusing on ISIS only, Daesh. ISIS is a small detail in the geopolitical landscape of what's going on in the area. ISIS is misused by foreign intelligence services to rampage and expand this chaos I was referring to all over the area. Why? It's very simple. In their mind, in the mind of the philosophers of this creative chaos, by triggering a sectarian war in the area between Muslims and Muslims, they call it Shiite and Sunni. It's like Orthodox and Catholics 500 years ago in Europe. By triggering this kind of sectarian war in the area, the Israeli policies in, the, in, in Palestine would have enough time to absorb the Palestinian question, to kill the dream of, the, of having a Palestinian state, to deviate the attention of the international public opinion towards another front, another war, that will never end. You know, religion, religious wars star, start, but they never end. And this is what they are seeking, to deviate the attention from the Israeli settlement policies, the Israeli illegal practices against the Palestinians, but also against the Syrians in the Golan, so that the Israelis will have enough time to implement their strategic plan of killing the Palestinian state dream and bringing further settlers to settle on the occupied territories. This is the big uh, headline. This is a big scenario. And this is why I said, I have just said that Daesh, ISIS, is a small detail in the geopolitical landscape. We shouldn't focus on them. We should focus on those who are backing ISIS, those who are backing Daesh, those who are sponsoring them, collecting them from the four corners of the, of the planet, sponsoring them, training them in Jordan, in Turkey, the Saudi money, the Qatari money, the Kuwaiti, the Emiratis. These people should be questioned and should be held accountable. ISIS is just a bunch of criminals. We know that. You know that. Everybody knows that. But we should stop those who are backing them, those who are using them, those who are encouraging them to slaughter innocent people, whether in Syria or in Iraq. I'm very thrilled once again to uh, sit with this distinguished panelists to share with you their own experience uh, after their return from Syria, after their uh, adventure in Syria, where they participated at overseeing 
the, and observing the uh, presidential elections uh, in Syria. So without further delay, I thank you very much, both the anti-war movement, SAF, and, and everybody else who uh, worked uh, very hard to organize this uh, important gathering this, in, in this, uh, this evening. So I thank you very much, and I will give it the floor. Thank you. Let me first start by really thanking Ambassador Dr. Bashar Jafari for really an explanation of what is at stake in Syria today. I'm Sarah Flounders from the International Action Center. I had the honor to travel to Syria last September at a time of great risk, and I had visited Syria in the past. Palestinian conferences. Uh, welcome, Ramsey. Uh, and tonight we're here to hear about what is a great accomplishment by a people under relentless attack more than three years. And this election was a historic accomplishment. The Syrian government has been a target of regime change, demonized by the Western media, a third of the population displaced, entire cities looted. And for three years, the media has predicted, and US officials, that the government would collapse any day now, any day, any day, any week, any month. But Syria held on and reorganized and protected and defended those who were homeless, those who were displaced, managed to beat back the insurgency, who were using terror tactics with top funding from Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, all with US and NATO coordination. Really tens of thousands, a mercenary army from 68 countries, if you can imagine. It attracted mercenaries, fanatics, and pirates of the planet to Syria. And this election, imagine defending 9,000, more than 9,000 polling places on election day. Isn't that an accomplishment? A quite incredible accomplishment. <laughs> Now, U.S. wars are organized to bring chaos, to sow dissension, ethnic and religious divisions. It's the old, old policy of divide and conquer. And it's systematic. It's not an accident. It's the way the wars are fought. And it creates a horror that lasts a generation and more. We can see the heritage of it in Iraq today. And as the ambassador so well explained, ISIS, the Islamic State of Syria and Iraq, a fanatical, subsidized group, funded by the Saudis, yes, but organized and coordinated by U.S. and NATO forces. The Syrians know what they're fighting to prevent, and they know what the future holds if they fail. Millions of Syrians choose unity, and sovereignty. And tonight's program is organized why, with our good friends in the Syrian American Forum. It's so important that here in the U.S. today, there is such a strong Syrian American voice defending, defending and explaining Syria to people in the U.S. who see that every war brings destruction to U.S. cities as Dr. Martin Luther King said in an earlier time, that the bombs that fall in Vietnam fall in the cities of the U.S. And that's even more so true today. It takes great courage, I'm sure, for Syrian Americans to speak out and to hold firm. And I want to especially thank Avin Durki, a poet and an artist, who helped in this program and in others. 
Tonight's program is also co-sponsored by the Syrian Solidarity Movement that has helped nationally in building solidarity with Syria in forums and in meetings. And these five delegates will do so much to explain in just a few minutes each their explanations, what they saw, each of them a different vignette, and each of them were actually in different uh, polling areas, different cities across Syria. And uh, their contribution at the uh, press conference organized today uh, at the UN with the UN Correspondents Association, uh, it just gave a real description. So I think everyone here will understand more uh, what's happening in <coughs> Syria today listening to them. Our first speaker is Scott Williams. He's a national coordinator of an anti-imperialist youth organization here in the U.S. called FIST, Fight Imperialism, Stand Together. He's also an organizer with the International Action Center, and he's mobilized demonstrations against U.S. wars in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Libya, and Syria, and for several years was a union organizer of low-wage workers. He was also active with the Occupy Wall Street movement. So Scott Williams to lead off. Wow. Well, first of all, it is my honor to speak first out of, out of our delegation. It's a report back on our tremendous trip to really see what democracy in action looks like. Again, my name is Scott Williams with the International Action Center, and I've been active since 2007, organizing against the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, and now the conflicts going on in Ukraine, in Venezuela, and again in Iraq. <laughs> um, you know, all of us are going to share our stories, but I wanted to start with a little bit of a, a political analysis and then go into my trip. And I wanted to start here, right in the U.S. So. You know, as election observers, you know, we did this because we believe in, in real democracy. The ultimate aim of democratic elections are to serve as a test of the people's desires, of the hopes and dreams of millions of people in any country. Yet, as we know, every election has its shortcomings, and some more than others. And that's why I wanted to start here in the U.S. So the most obvious example of flawed elections that I could think of comes from the United States. <coughs> We choose from our politicians who are millionaires, who spend all day fighting each other over who can give more tax breaks, more budget cuts, start more wars, and give more concessions to big businesses. Decisions to spend over 50% of the budget on the Pentagon are made in country clubs, in executive suites, and by friendly f handshakes of you know, people who went to college together in elite Ivy League schools. Here we have voter participation, which is limited by the difficult voter registration requirements. And also, voting is limited by income and by, frankly, by the lack of faith in the political process. And that's why we've seen in almost every election that over a majority of people do not vote. And as they say, not voting is a vote, and it's a vote against the system. So in 2008, we remember it was a historic election of President Barack Obama here in the United States. Uh, this was the biggest turnout in quite a while, with 57% of voters voting in the presidential election. Yet still, in a country of 300 million people, and only a portion of which are adults, uh, 51, people, 51 million people in the United States were not even registered to vote. They couldn't even go to the polls. That's a, over a quarter of the adult population. Um, and then the number of people who were barred when they went to go vote, and then they were, their election was thrown out, their voting was thrown out in 2008, was more than the margin of you know, the previous two presidential elections to show you how much there are just consistent you know, problems with, the, with what they call the so-called democracy here. Um, you know, still that year, 20 or 58 countries across the world had a greater turnout, including Iran, Russia, Bolivia, Venezuela, countries all over the world. The U.S. ranked in the bottom half. If you compare the Syrian election this year, just two weeks ago, it would rank as the 20th most highly, the 20th highest 
uh, vote in the entire world as far as voter turnout. And that's given the conditions of millions of refugees, of millions of people displaced from their homes, and of the, line, and the, and of the U.S. and NATO countries limiting the vote of Syrian refugees in the United States and throughout Europe, and in the Gulf states as well. So given the conditions, I think that it, it shows you what real democracy looks like. The West has a bad habit of holding up Europe and North America as bastions of democracy. Commentators from Brussels to Washington have, conveni have can use convenient demands all over the world for free and fair elections. And we see this almost every week. Um, you know, they, they're trying to appeal to people's basic idea of democracy and self-rule. But when the U.S. touts democracy, it conveniently is reflecting its own bias or ignoring its own bias for, and looking for, the, for its own local rule of, of a small group of leaders that will compromise with the um, IMF that will compromise with NATO, and that will compromise with the demands of the U.S. military and the corporations. And that is the problem that the U.S. has with Dr. Bashar al-Assad, and that is the problem that the U.S. has with people all over the world. And, uh, you know, it, it's tremendous. Visiting Syria, you know, you could see that the Syrian people have given up so much. And not just in the, in the most recent three years of war, but over the decades. With, you know, we realize that the role of the IMF in Syria over the past decades has, has caused many gift banks. You know, where the, Syria has had to pay back millions in foreign debt and with extorted interest rates. And then and Syrians have had to raise the prices on subsidized food and gasoline and, and, and social programs that, that people need. And we realize that there's serious give backs that have been happening for at least the last decade. Made, what makes this even worse, though, is that the right-wing insurgents, whatever they call the so-called rebels, which I'll never use that word, um, they've robbed over 1,000 factories and equipment in just the city of Aleppo alone. Um, and this has cost over $200 billion in one city, $200 billion, uh, I'm sorry, 200 billion Syrian pounds of damage. Um, you know, worse yet, they're stealing Syrian oil, estimates of over $600 million a year of revenue that goes for the Syrian people. And they've destroyed over 600 medical facilities across the country. We learn the gruesome stories of people and what this means to them, and they describe this as living in a horror movie, as you can imagine. But, so, you know, with crisis, you know, there comes a fight back, and in Syria, you know, the, for the days before and after the election that we were there, you know, millions of Syrians came out to support their president. Um, you know, some of them have serious challenges and, 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 and needs from the government, but just like any internal conflict that a group faces, they unite when they're fighting a common enemy. And that is the difference between the crisis in Syria and, and the things that we see across the so-called sectarian violence and the chaos that's been created by U.S. imperialism. The people of Syria are united, and the people of Syria will never lose to the U.S. And that was the feeling that I got. I toured Sueda on election day in southern Syria. And I was with a group of Venezuelans, Bolivians, Brazilians, and along with Jane. I hope she'll share her stories as well. And in Sueda, there were spontaneous gatherings everywhere in the city. We must have visited 15 polling places. And every single place you go, there are people left and right who it looks like, a, like the town is having the biggest celebration it's ever had. And that's because the people are out in support of their government. And that unity, that unity is what can defeat the U.S. attacks. And as someone in the United States who cares about democracy, who cares about freedom, and who cares about a government which provides for the people's needs, to me, it was really motivating to come back to the U.S. and bring this story and take this. And that's why I'm excited to say that we are organizing across the United States a tour in cities, next week we're going to be in Philadelphia. I think tomorrow Joe is going to be in Chicago. We're going to be all over the country spreading, you know, showing our pictures, sh telling our stories, and, and, and coming together with people from the Syrian American Forum, with all of our friends and allies across the political movement, to come and tell the story of, of why the Syrian people are setting the standard, and the Syrian people are really leading the way, and, and we owe it so much to them, and we need to support them. And lastly, I just want to say, you know, our demand, it's clear, we've been using the demand, U.S. hands off Syria. And that it's been effective in a lot of ways. But we must be clear, and, and especially with the unfolding situation in Iraq, we must be clear that the only way to stop this war and the only way for people anywhere 
to get freedom and real freedom, you know, we must take disarm the United States and, and the people who can do that are the people here in the United States by creating a political movement to stop these wars and stop spending trillions on, on devastation and misery for millions of people. I'm honored to be here today. I'm excited to hear more personal stories and thank you all for coming. Thank you, Scott Williams. Uh, this sound isn't really working, I think, so we'll just let it go. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Jane Stillwater, and Jane is a freelance journalist, uh, travel writer, and a blogger. Uh, she's traveled widely throughout the world, uh, also been an embedded journalist. Uh, she works part-time as a paralegal and also as an actor, and she's a mother of four children. So Jane Stillwater. Thank you. And this is no act. Um, I haven't slept in a couple of days, and I've noticed that the more tired I get, the more general my comments get. So I'll start with the specific and go to the general. How many of you here have actually been to Syria? Raise your hand. Well, then I don't have to tell you. Syria is, Syria is wonderful. The people of Syria are just wonderful. And um, as for the election, uh, when I was a child, I used to watch my mother running a polling place in her home and watch her stay up late and count the ballots. So I know from early experience what a fair election looks like. I also reported on recent presidential elections in Florida and Ohio, and we all know what happened there. And uh, of course, I myself have voted many times over the year, but I have never seen anything <coughs> in the states even close to the enthusiasm and even outright joy that I witnessed um, while observing the elections in Syria. Uh, do I think that they were a valid election? You bet. Okay, so then from there I went kind of like, okay, let's talk about ISIS. And this is the speech that I gave today at the UN. After being an election observer in Syria, I see ISIS from a whole new perspective. Every time I hear the phrase Islamic militant, I cringe. ISIS members are not Muslims. Let's get this clear. They are not Muslims. They are no more Muslims than Adolf Hitler was a Christian, even though he claimed to be. Muslims believe in compassion and justice. These ISIS guys are pirates. ISIS main modus operandi in Syria was to move into a city or town, kill or drive out the civilian population, and then <coughs> loot, slash, and burn. They were pirates. And the same thing happened in Mosul, where the first thing ISIS did was to loot the central bank of a half million dollars while flying <coughs> their... Billion. 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 I'm sorry. Billion. Good. I'm glad you guys are listening. I'm just still kind of tired. What, and you've all seen the ISIS flag. It's a black and white Jolly Roger. And ISIS doesn't want to capture Baghdad either. What it was after was the oil refinery. ISIS doesn't want to convert anyone to Islam. All they want is show me the money. And American taxpayers are paying billions of dollars to weaponize and train these crooks and robbers. And I went on to compare Bush and Cheney with Bluebeard, um, who gave birth to ISIS, and Obama is no Captain Jack Sparrow either. Okay, so now I'm really generalizing. I'm just, I'm tired, I need to sleep. So I'm just really generalizing. Here, here it goes. Um, I read somewhere that there are four things that human beings need to survive. Air, water, food.
food and to feel good about themselves. Yet, despite me knowing this, I'm afraid that in the name of truth, I'm going to have to ignore this all and make a whole lot of people on Wall Street and War Street feel very bad about themselves. Sorry about that. Lately, everyone on the news has been talking constantly about the 70th anniversary of D-Day. D-Day this, D-Day that. But I have yet to hear anyone talking, talking head mention the recent 100th anniversary of World War I. Probably the most unnecessary and, well, er, uh, just plain stupid war ever fought. But sadly, America's foreign policy has just gotten dumb and dumber ever since. Next up, the badly designed Treaty of Versailles led to a very preventable World War II. And then we lost China and Korea. And just what dummy dreamed up the Cold War? Then came Vietnam, a really stupid war. A 10-year-old could have designed a better foreign policy than that. Trillions of dollars wasted and millions of lives destroyed. Then came the loss of South America's hearts and minds, the shambles that is Africa today, and the disaster after disaster in the Middle East, as our State Department just keeps riding on their express train to stupid town. But this new war on Syria has just got to be America's foreign policy's all-time <coughs> low, unless, of course, you count their support of the neo-Nazis in Ukraine. America has actually hired al-Qaeda, of all people, to spearhead an invasion of Syria, a place where America shouldn't even have a dog in the fight, let alone an al-Qaeda dog. And America's military-industrial complex actually supports ISIS and Daesh. A five-year-old could have designed a better foreign policy than that, solely based on what his kindergarten teacher taught him. And as an American, I just want this stupidity to stop. Thank you, Jane. Uh, okay, we're next going to hear from Judy Bello, who is a, a part of the Administrative Committee of the United National Anti-War Coalition, and she's a founder of the Upstate Coalition to Ground the Drones and End the War. She's traveled in the past e extensively to other hot spots, including to uh, Iran with the Fellowship of Reconciliation, um, to Iraq, Pakistan, and uh, was part of this uh, delegation. So, uh, Judy Bellow. Hi. Um, I'm really um, pleased to be here with you today. And uh, uh, since I uh, went to Syria as an observer, and maybe some of you haven't been there that recently, or you just like to hear stories about um, being in Syria and some of the people I met uh, when I was observing the election. And I thought that would be a nice, uh, something you might be interested in hearing about. So um, I went to Tartus. I did not uh, choose to go to one of the hot spots in, uh, at the moment in Syria. Uh, and I guess I just wanted to know more about the country. And when I went there, uh, from the very beginning, I had it in my mind that as a woman, I wanted to reach out to Syrian women, because here in America, we don't know much about, you know, the lives of Arab women and Syrian women uh, in particular. And uh, just to hear some of their uh, feedback on the election and on life in the war and life in Syria. So. Um, to go to Tartus, I had to fly, and um, so we went to this uh, Damascus International Airport. 
Um, when we left, all I saw was this one little plane that we were flying on in this beautiful uh, building uh, uh, that they have uh, empty, except for uh, a couple of the people with me and um, these three or no, four lovely uh, Pakistani people who flew out with us and um, some North Koreans. So uh, I got on the plane, one woman uh, amongst about 40 people, and we flew to uh, Latakia. And when we flew in, there was a snake line of people there waiting for us in the airport to greet us. And uh, so we had a whole uh, large group of greeters uh, receiving line. We went down the receiving line. And I immediately knew that I was right about wanting to meet the Syrian women because there were these three women in the middle of this long line, mostly men. And when I reached them in the receiving line, one by one, they each gave me a huge hug and kissed me three times on the cheek and said, welcome to Syria. So uh, this was really very heartening to me. And it turns out that the three of them are all uh, MPs and uh, members of the parliament in Syria. And uh, two of them were from Tartus and one from Latakia. And so um, I traveled the rest of my journey uh, with, among other people, the two women uh, from Tartus. So uh, we got in our cars, and um, I traveled at first in a car with a group of men, again, MPs. I, I, my translator was late, and we picked her up a couple stops down the road. and. Um, because apparently they called her in the morning and said, show up, we need an English translator right now. And so it took her a little bit to meet us. But in the car, uh, there was a man named Nisar who was uh, translating, and he introduced each of the men in the car, and um, this man's a businessman, and this man's a doctor, and finally, uh, and I'm an attorney, and finally a man got in the car, and he said, this is a dentist, so if you need help with your teeth, um, he's, he'd be happy to help you. And I said, well, it sounds like any service I need is provided by someone in this car. So I think I'm in good hands. And um, uh, my, again, Nisar was, uh, said that he was uh, born in uh, Banyas, which was our first stop. And uh, before we got there, though, he told me a story. Uh, uh, he showed me a, br uh, well, a place where th there had been a bridge where uh, 40 uh, young uh, Syrian soldiers were killed uh, when the uh, insurgents uh, blew the bridge out from under them. Uh, and he, uh, and I realized, you know, as we came into Banyas, there were uh, images everywhere of the young people from that community who had died in this war because Syria, uh, as many of you know, has a draft. And so the people who are fighting uh, to save their country are, uh, many of them are 18 to 20 year olds and who, have, who are serving their regular military duty. And it's very heartbreaking, even for the communities where the war isn't like pressed right up against them to have their youth uh, at this level of risk because most of the people, the largest, single largest group of people killed in this war are Syrian soldiers. Um, so uh, we, uh, as we drove into Tartus, I'd just like to say, uh, I remembered uh, the day before that the Speaker of the Parliament um, had told us that um, Syria is, um, um, See, uh, food self-sufficient and there were miles and miles of little greenhouses with plastic covers packed with uh, tomatoes and uh, corn and other vegetables uh, among the olive groves so I better uh, move along with my story though I just wanted to tell you my translator story and then I'll be done um, she said to me after we'd been traveling quite a while together and we were sharing single mother stories because I'm a single mother and she was a widow and she said um, I asked her about the election, and she said, actually, I used to be a rebel. She said, uh, my husband and my brother both died quite a while ago, and my brother in particular died in a Syrian prison, and we were never able to get his body back, and it was heartbreaking for our family. And I said, wow, and now you're translating for this trip, and um, are you going to vote for Bashar Assad? And she said, yes, actually, I am, because, you know, uh, I came here from Hama, and um, I was able to go to school for free, 
and I became an English teacher and now I am the supervisor for all of the English teachers in Tartus. And uh, she said, I've never been so happy in my life because I'm a respected member of the community. And I, I still feel heartbroken when I think about what happened to my brother. But right now, I have a good life. My children are in college and they have prospects for a good life. And I really want to see uh, security and civilization restored because those uh, are working for me and my family. And I thought that was an incredibly moving story and that uh, this woman who'd essentially been abandoned by the men in her family because they died in uh, the process or you know in the process of rebelling against the government now finds herself happy being a citizen of the country and at peace with uh, what's going on there so I really had wanted to tell you this story and I have many others so maybe you'll read my blog and hear them uh, in the future uh, deconstructedglobe.com and um, I'm very happy again to meet all of you thank you Thank you, Judy. We're next going to hear from Joe Eiosbacher, who is an activist with the Anti-War Committee in Chicago. And nationally, Joe is on the Administrative Committee of the United National Anti-War Coalition. He was one of the coordinators of a very important uh, national coalition march of 15,000 people against NATO when NATO, uh, you could say, invaded Chicago to hold a big international gathering and in doing so shut down the whole city of Chicago in an effort to shut down quite an important demonstration. Uh, and of course he's also been very active uh, in the movement to oppose U.S. intervention in Syria. So Joe Eisbacher. Thank you and again it's an honor uh, to be here this evening uh, with all of you. Mr. Ambassador, uh, and friends, friends from Chicago uh, who have now translated, transplanted to New York. Um, I, I, I wanted to tell you, first of all, that um, I also uh, wrote uh, about one article a day while I was in Syria, and there are copies back there on, um, the, uh, on the table. Um, I published them in uh, fightbacknews.org. You can find them. Um, and uh, I want to begin, though, by, by telling um, uh, an experience that that I have that I think the people of Syria do not have. So we have been told in the United States these last three years that Syria is a one-party state. You've all heard this expression, one-party state. Well, I actually happen to live in a one-party state. It's called Chicago. <laughs> in the city of Chicago, no, it's true. Um, there has not been, uh, the, every mayor has been from the same party, the Democratic Party, Barack Obama's party, since 1931, ni almost 90 years, same party in power. In Chicago, there are 50 members of the city council. Guess how many there are that are Republicans? None. Guess when the last time there was any Republicans in the city council in Chicago? 1948. There are 25 members of the state council from Chicago, all Democrats. There are six members of the federal uh, Congress, they call them, all Democrats. There has not been a Republican elected in Chicago in anyone's lifetime. And so, what you see from that, um, it is a joke, of course, to call it a one-party state. What it is, is the people of Chicago, they're Democrats. And what I saw in, the, in Syria is that the vast majority of the people <coughs> came out to vote for the men that they felt represented their interests. And what were their interests? First and foremost, <laughs> was to end this war. And second, to restore the Syria 
that existed until three years ago. A prosper prosperous, a secular country where everyone belonged. So I came away from Syria with this hope, that this election would mark the beginning of the end of this war. You know, we heard from um, Ba'ath Party activists, we heard from um, uh, Jihad al-Laham, uh, the, uh, the Speaker of the Parliament, and from regular people at the polling places, that the right-wing rebels really are, are already beaten. They have no vision uh, they're, uh, to keep them fighting. You know, clearly, 73% of the population came out and voted. Um, the rebels are isolated, uh, and even the Pentagon recognizes that they're losing militarily. So the only question in my mind is, will the United States allow this war to come to an end? Um, and, you know, or will they continue to fund it? And will they look for more pretexts, like the lies about the chemical gas last summer? Um, and, you know, because I, I cannot say yes, in fact, I'm almost certain that the answer is no, this leads to the role that we all have going back home. The, um, there's a very low level of understanding. I, I'm telling you, you already know this because you live here. There's a very low level of understanding of Syria among the American people. Um, but uh, so we have a we have a lot we have a job to do, um, and and it's helpful to understand uh, something though in understanding the job we have to do, which is while it's it's uphill in teaching the American people. The American people, and we told this to the Syrians at every rally, at every polling place, they don't want this war. They are tired of war. We have not lost as many sons and daughters as you have lost. But we have lost, you know, 7,000 dead in the last uh, 11 years, and, um, and, and we've spent our, uh, our, our, our national wealth as well. So. Um, I also want to, um, I'm actually going to abuse my, uh, my privilege and stay on the mic for one more minute. I also want to tell you that I know that we can have an impact on the, on, uh, the U.S. plans for war because we did it last summer. We helped to stop the plans to bomb Syria. And I also know that we are a th considered a threat by the U.S. government because my home was raided by the FBI uh, several years ago for my anti-war activity. And I have to tell you that while we are building this anti-war movement, we also have to defend our people. We have to defend the anti-war protesters, and we have to defend, especially in, in the United States, the Arab and Muslim, and especially the Palestinian population, because they are under attack by the U.S. government. And I'm going to tell you about one case in particular from Chicago, my dear sister, Rasmia Oda. She is being put on trial in the United States because they claim that uh, she was uh, convicted by an Israeli military court uh, in 1969 for being a terrorist. They tortured her into confession, and now they're going to put her on trial. She's been a citizen for 20 years, living a model life. They want to put her in prison at age 66 and then deport her for something that she never did. She was, she was tortured, brutally tortured into confessing to this crime that the Israelis accuse her of. She's going on trial on September 8th in Detroit. I'm going to be there, and I would invite everyone to join me in Detroit on September 8th. Thank you, everyone. And I, I do hope everyone here will actually go online and sign the petition for Rosme O'Day, along with paying great attention to the September 8th uh, court date. Okay, last of the five delegates, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Paul LaRudy. He is a faculty member of several universities in the San Francisco Bay Area. He is an organizer with the Palestine Solidarity Movement and the International Solidarity Movement in Palestine and was a co-founder of the movement to break the Israeli siege of Gaza by sea. He was aboard the boats that succeeded in doing so in 2008 and participated in the Gaza Freedom Flotilla. Uh, he was a co-founder of the Global March to Jerusalem. So uh, next up, Dr. Paul Arudi. Uh, 
uh, one of my other credentials is that I'm a piano tuner. Uh, so I have a special interest in promoting harmony. So. <laughs> Um, some of you will remember, maybe better than me, that the former Consul General of Israel to New York, uh, I think only, only a year ago, was visiting here and he was asked by one of the uh, Zionist publications uh, what he thought would be the best outcome in Syria f as far as Israel is concerned. What's Israel's interest? And his, his name, I think, was Pinchon or Pinchas, one of these. Anyway, he, he said, the best uh, outcome, as far as Israel is concerned, is no outcome. No outcome. Now, that is honesty, because Israel, and this is quite reflective of the United States, and that's not an accident. Israel and the United States coincide in their view, it's eternal in, uh, conflict and death and destruction. This is the future for uh, Syria and Iraq and Libya and, and all of these. This, let's, let's, let's be honest about it. This is, this is, uh, this is what, what the purpose is. Uh, in order to create weakness, among uh, groups that are considered allies and to show nations of the world that if they do not uh, do exactly what the United States and NATO says, there will be hell to pay. This is what it's about. What is Syria's sin? Syria it has no foreign debt. It doesn't l permit uh, other companies to come in there and own half of the country and to export its wealth. And this, this, this is the problem with Syria. This is why Syria has to, has to be destroyed. This is, and yet, the American people don't feel this way. The American people are ashamed of, of causing death and destruction if, if they even understand that, that, that it is our government that is causing this. This, this is terrible. So I, I want to thank the Syrian people for uh, showing us in this election, which we went to as observers, and we have to come out with an observation. And our observation is that uh, the Syrian people who traveled from across the world, we met uh, Syrian uh, people, when we were in Syria, we met people from uh, the United States and from many other countries who traveled there in order to vote. Who does this? And, um, and they, uh, uh, they voted in massive numbers in foreign countries when they could, when they were not prevented from doing it. Who is going to do this? And yet the, uh, the outcome was certain. We knew what the outcome was going to be. We knew who, who was going to. Why do they do this? Well, I'll tell you why. They, because because they were sending a message. And what is an election if it is not sending a message to uh, the entire world and to their leadership <coughs> about who, who they want? And they did. They did in massive numbers. Compare that, for example, with the election in Egypt, where 92% of the people voted for el-Sisi. Well, 92% of what, what people? You know, How many people showed up? And there were at least twice as many who showed up in the Syrian election as in the Egyptian election. That is the difference. That is the difference. Because they, the, the, what the Syrian people wanted was very clear. And, what, and that is the purpose of an election. And that's what we saw. We, uh, now, uh, Joe and I were together in Homs. And we saw the same things that everyone else has reported. Uh, just a jubilant celebration. Just it was, it was, it was a way people said as much outside the polling booth as they did inside the polling booth, and and it was it was magnificent. So uh, and and who are the Syrian people? There were uh, uh, what about the occupied areas of 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 Syria where no one uh, could vote? Well, those people voted with their feet. 
They left those occupied areas. They, uh, six million of them, are living in government-controlled uh, uh, areas uh, of Syria because they prefer that to living un under, uh, uh, under the regime of terrorists, basically. So they, they, they voted, and they voted a second time by casting their ballot in those government areas. And furthermore, they voted not to become refugees over outside Syria because twice as many of them are displa displaced persons within Syria as they are outside Syria. Twice as many preferred to live um, in, in Syria under government control rather than to go to Lebanon or to, to Turkey or, to, or anywhere else. That's impressive. So uh, I, one little story I'll tell you about, about Homs is that the, um, I happened to go back after the election. And I happened to be in a meeting where, uh, where municipal leaders and leaders of the Christian community were, try, were discussing the reconstruction of the old city of Homs. And they had everything down to the last stone and the last owner of every single place and how it was going to be constructed and who was going to do the work, do the work and wh which foundations were going to provide the funding. This is less than a month after, after, the, after it was liberated. So what I saw there was a people that were determined to have for their will to be imposed upon the future of Syria, not only in the terms of their president, but in rebuilding wherever it was possible to rebuild in the retaken areas. I don't think these people are going to lose this war. <coughs> I don't think so. They're absolutely <laughs> determined. I want to thank every one of you when you speak now, I felt our kids telling me thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to everyone fighting to bring the peace in my country and let our kids have the peace and happy. Every word you say, my soul fly and hug each kid in Syria. And tell them we here. We try to bring. We try to bring the happiness and the peace to you. Thanks a lot from my heart, and our kids' heart, and our Syrian people. Thanks a lot. It's so interesting hearing five people speak. They all traveled to Syria, and not one of them repeated one point <laughs> that another speaker made. Uh, they looked at it each with different eyes and from different experiences, and that makes for quite an interesting. And it's also true in the articles. There's a listing in the back. A number of those articles were reprinted, so I really encourage you, and on their blogs, it's all over the Internet, uh, to read these because there are a lot of experiences uh, and personal vignettes and stories of who they met uh, that really help to explain in many ways Syria. Uh, before I introduce our next uh, speaker here, uh, I want to say that um, after Ramsey Clark speaks, uh, we'll have a, a little time for some uh, questions or comments. Uh, from from the floor. Uh, we won't go too long. We have a couple of other things to do, but it is an honor for me to introduce Ramsey Clark, who is a founder of the International Action Center. Uh, as, as you all know, he's a former U.S. Attorney General, uh, an international human rights lawyer. I traveled to Syria with Ramsey in September and to Iraq many times over the years of U.S. sanctions. Of course, he also has traveled to Iran during the most difficult times and for Palestine endlessly, along with we could list so many other countries and struggles. Uh, but 
works for political prisoners here, death row prisoners, those in solitary and in isolation right here in the United States. And we can never forget that the largest prison population in the world is right here. The largest number of people on death row, the largest number of people in solitary confinement. So um, Ramsey Clark has also <coughs> been a voice for them. So please join me in welcoming Ramsey Clark. Here has been beautiful and important to the human condition for as long as history. And um, we dare not let it be destroyed. <coughs> I don't know which one of these sounds. Does that sound? Yeah, but it doesn't. Well, we'll see. If there's a hum, we'll turn it off. <coughs> I'll speak louder if I can. <coughs> <coughs> That's it. Can y'all hear me in the back now? Yes. Okay. I'll give you a Texas shout if you're not careful. <laughs> so hold your ears. <coughs> the, the great mosque in um, Damascus has in the center of it the tomb of John the Baptist and they're always I've never been in there there weren't people praying in there but around that tomb there are as many Muslims as there are Christians in fact there, there are more Muslims than there are Christians <coughs> and there are three minarets <coughs> for this mosque it's, it's a huge and gorgeous piece of architecture and history and one of the three is named for Jesus which uh, I've always thought um, reveals the possibility of peace on earth <laughs> um, we owe a lot to Syria and with a lot of the courage of the people in this terrible experience that they've been going through that God willing is approaching um, an end. I think circumstances may or chance may get the US military off their backs Our country ha holds the primary responsibility. It's a hard thing for an American to have to say, particularly if you'd like to be able to love your country and still love truth and justice. But our duty as citizens here is to end our militarism All my life, it's just been militarism. <coughs> Korea and Vietnam, and Vietnam is a, is amazing. Last year was the 40th anniversary of the end of the Vietnamese War, and it was a hellacious war. I mean, we did everything we could to just <laughs> destroy that country, <coughs> and the people are thriving. The people are happy. It may be f five members of the family on, on one um, motorcycle, but um, they're happy. They've got plenty of food. The schools are good. There's, there's really only one remembrance of the war that they can't escape, and that's uh, the deformed infants that are still being born from Agent Orange. Nothing like the numbers that occurred earlier, but still it's hard to go in a 
hospital's maternity ward and not see a handful of cruelly deformed infants, which is one of the most horrible things that war brings. Syria is critically important to peace on earth and um, our country has been the principal power exercising violence, constantly refining technology for death. And uh, we have to find the will to stand up and resist and reverse that. And um, we need to do it while Syria can still help us see uh, the beauty and dignity of humanity and what many believe is the oldest city in the world, the oldest continuously populated place in the world, the world, the capital of Syria, can be a center for not just the survival, but uh, finally the realization of the full potential of the human species. The survival of Syria is essential to the survival of humanity, I, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, Ramsey. Well, before Avin, just we want to do this together. Um, before we go in the next part of our program, um, as everything that we do, it's a collective effort. That's the best and the strongest and the only way anything is really built. And Syria is a good example of a united effort of people of all different backgrounds religions, ethnic groups pulling together. Uh, now, when we were first invited to uh, be part of this press conference at the United Nations, no one could come up with the travel expenses to get here on short notice. So we asked the speakers to put this on their credit cards and that we would try here today to recoup as much of this as possible. Now, to we're coming on short notice from the West Coast, uh, and one from Chicago, one from Rochester. Now, Scott, he only came from Philadelphia, so that would have been easy. <laughs> but uh, we are going to take up a collection, but not just a collection. Jane brought back a very beautiful, very beautiful shirt here today, and we're going to have an auction. <laughs> We're going to have an auction, and um, now I guess we'll do, do what do you think? Um, pass the hat and an auction. Yes, we're going to pass the hat, too. Everybody here is going to give. Everybody here is going to give. To uh, we need to raise $2,500. Now, that sounds like a lot, and I don't think we'll raise it all here tonight, but we might make a real chunk in this, right? So, so no one goes home impoverished, uh, especially folks from the West Coast and, and Chicago, right? So let's see. We'll take and we'll hopefully bid this beautiful shirt, which is the flag itself. <laughs> That's patriotism. This is Syria. This is, this is Syria. <laughs> that is, my goodness. 
Oh, we're, we're still going to pass these red buckets because everyone yes. here, yeah, everyone. we uh, want to continue. We want to take this on the road. And we can do that with donations of everyone here. You can also make tax deductible donations. That's to People's Rights Fund. You can put in all the paper that's in your pocket or anything in between. Uh, because that really, uh, I think you heard from the speakers, and we want to have forums across the country, and to do it in participation with the Syrian American Forum and with the Syria Solidarity Movement. And we'll be reaching out to many, many other forces. I think there are there's, are there some red buckets in the back? Uh, Sarah? And, yes? Can right I ahead. give you another reason to raise yes. additional funds? Yes. Um, I happen to be the treasurer of the Syria Solidarity Movement, which is one of only three groups that are working together. It's also uh, the International Action uh, Center and the uh, S uh, Syrian American Forum. Um, I was asked by my group to, to look at our fund situation. So before coming here, I checked on all of our, what we owe and what we spend and so forth. The total amount that we have in our uh, bottom line is $109. Okay, that's what, after spending on all these other things, that's what we have, $109. And I know <coughs> that uh, IAC uh, also just lives on a very, very small income. So, so please, if you want to enable us to do the kinds of things that, w that we're you. doing, we need your funds, and and uh, and this will be a wonderful way to for us to go back <laughs> and to shame some of the other people that we have to by saying, look what these people in New York donated. So we're. We're, uh, we're looking for you to, to teach a lesson. And you already have, by the way. <laughs> so thank you. And as I say, if you want to make tax deductible uh, donations, that's to the People's Rights Fund. People's Rights Fund. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm going to speak in Arabic. I'm going to speak in Arabic. I'm going to speak in Arabic. We're a small group. The small group is the small group. We have to help them. We don't want to come to the street and say things like that, but we're going to work in the same way. But I want to tell you that the small group is the small group. نحن لنقدر نكون نأثر على القرار لازم ندعم نحن الكونغرس لازم ندعمهم بالانتخابات لازم نوقف معهم فمعناتها نحن لازمنا كمان دعم من السوريين لنصير مثل اللوبي الصهيوني لنقدر نكون ناخد قرار لا تطلعوا على المؤسسة هلأ تطلعوا عليها بعد سنتين لولادكم لولاد ولادكم لأحفادكم ممكن نحن نكون نكسير نقدر نحط القرار وقت اللي منكبر اللوبي تبعنا منحترمه منقدم له لنكبر نحن وياه لنكون نحن وصلنا على القرار وهنيئا لسوريا بفكرة ساف هنيئا إلا بالفكرة لأنه نحن بدينا صح وإن شاء الله حتشوفوا النتائج لقدام الكل عم يشتغل بصمت سياسة مع سيناتورز مع كونغرس لنقدر نكون أثر على القرار الأمريكي لو في الحرب على سوريا لنقدر ناخذ القرار لصالح كل سوري موجود هون مغترب فبتمنى من حضراتكم كل مين بيقدر يساوي دونيشن كمان لساف مشان نكبر ونقدر ندعم الكونغرس بالانتخابات مشان نقدر نكبر ونكون عنا نوصل للقرار لنقدر نأثر على القرار الأمريكي شكرا لكم Okay, uh, we're going to open the floor for a few minutes for comments and uh, might be questions, but uh, feel free or announcements right here. I know this doctor. 
want to thank you very much uh, on behalf of all the Syrians. Uh, all any of you, Paul, Joe, Jane, Scott. Uh, uh, who, who, who financed your trip? Did the Syrian government coerce you? Did they pay for you? Or better yet, did you have difficulty entering <coughs> Syria? And if there was no difficulty, how come none of our beloved American media was not there to represent all media to know what's happening? How come only a few courageous people like, like yourself are there uh, that we are so proud of and we are so comforted uh, with, with people like you? Yes, we will win and Syria would last. And I am with the LaRouche Political Action Committee, and I have recently been a candidate for U.S. Congress, so I think we could ask other nations to send some election observers to the United States uh, when we just experience. Uh, what I would like to address is um, what the ambassador said about the political situation, because People may remember in 1999, Tony Blair declared the end of the Westphalian system. And the Treaty of Westphalia ended the 30 years religious war, and the idea was that nations know revenge, and you act in the interest of other nations because we recognize that we only survive if we act in the interest of our neighbors. Tony Blair explicitly ended that policy. and. What you have now in Iraq, Syria, Ukraine are not mistakes. Uh, that what we are in is the end of the financial system. That 25 years ago this year, the Berlin Wall came down because you had the end of the Soviet system and Maggie Thatcher and George Bush opposed the reunification of <coughs> Germany and we had wars in Yugoslavia and Iraq. Now we have the end of this bubble. We are going to bail in where you have to pay to deposit your money in a bank. In the U.S. we see the pension funds being looted, the population being looted, and London and Wall Street want World War III before the system detonates. So the target is Russia, the target is China, the danger we are facing is a thermonuclear war. And uh, therefore, I do think it's urgent that President Obama be impeached for the same reasons Cheney and Bush should have been impeached, and that the United States must return to the constitutional system of credit, which means Glass-Steagall. We have to bankrupt Wall Street. We should not pay another dime to these, to re we should bankrupt the people behind Obama and behind the British Empire. And I think the United States should join with Russia, China, and India, who are now signing world historic agreements in the tradition of the Westphalian Agreement. And that is our true interest. And as we support people who are fighting for freedom internationally, we should also support the liberation of the United States from the Tony Blair British Imperial Doctrine. Hi everybody, my name is Shahid Kamred and I'm a Secretary General of Pakistan USA Freedom Forum. From the core of my heart, I give congratulations to the peoples of Syria who show the world that if we have to choose outsider, we will not choose outsider. We have a problem. We have a family rule, but nobody has a right to come to the cross the international border. And what happening last couple of days, that's everything against the Syrian will and wish of the people that you go in the Libya and use special forces, take away the human, it's a shameful. It's just like a barbarian. And I feel very sorry that in this country we should have to raise, but I salute the people's choice and they show the world that stay away your home, we will decide our problem, and they taste the vote. Tomorrow it will be better, better for the occupied Kashmir. Remember, we all people over here, never forget the real problem, occupation of the Palestinian, Kashmiri, never forget this thing. Still a lot of territory of the Syrian, the beloved country, occupied by this Israel. 
and we have to keep in our mind struggle is going on. Salute to the people of Syria. Tomorrow. Back to you. My question is to the ambassador and anyone else, uh, and it has to do with the U.S. government unintended consequences and its overreach for global domination. And the contradiction lies within that overreach. And that is now the U.S. is looking toward Iran that it has once and continues with this sort of two-headed monster of a policy that it has to isolate Iran that it is now looking for toward as a possible partner in resolving the situation, if I'm correct, this is the airheads in the U.S. media, in Syria, because the American people, I think, are becoming aware for the first time, and certainly it is true of the U.S. soldiers, that the U.S. is funding al-Qaeda and those jihadist elements in Syria, the same as they are, they are funding them in Syria the same as they have these elements fighting against Syria and other parts, including Iraq, which is exploding in the U.S. face, absolutely exploding. So the maneuverability to lie their way out of this situation is becoming much more fraught with uh, just a mind-blowing lies and contradictions that the American people are just beginning to become aware of. They can't keep it up. It's impossible. And this is in the midst of, a, of an economic collapse because the economy is collapsing, has collapsed, and they can't do it. And this, this military intervention um, really uh, trying to monopolize the resources of these countries through chaos, wars of chaos and division, it, it, it just can't work. It just can't work anymore. And uh, now they're faced with this obstacle. Are we going to send in U.S. troops? Well, we got to send them in, but we're really we're going to use drones. And, and people around the world are hating the U.S. because of the use of drone and the murder of children, women, old people. Now they're using drones by the New York City Police Department and public housing that is uh, largely occupied by blacks and Latinos. So all of this stuff is coming down on them because their quest for global domination is exploding in their face. And if you could comment on this, what is their uh, pivot toward Iran in order to resolve some of these, press, these uh, pressing issues within the region, not to mention uh, the troubles that they are now facing in the Ukraine? Just so you can ask. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, please. Uh, to answer your comment, one of the biggest disgraces that, as a military officer, that I, I'm so ash I love my country, but I despise my government for doing is that he is funding the same people that are killing our soldiers. Exactly. And to lie to our public and say that he's funding the people that are supposed, quote unquote helping to form the governments and support the countries like Syria that are supposedly helped to build the country where they're actually killing the people like these organizations, uh, <coughs> Qatar and Turkey. in Turkey, uh, Al Qaeda, the people that brought down the World Trade Center the people that are in Saudi Arabia who actually bankrolled the pilots to come here, get trained. It's a whole conspiracy that the American people, they turn a blind eye on, they don't want to hear the truth. 
and our government lies so much to cover up these facts that our own president, he, he lies so much that he doesn't know what the truth is anymore. <laughs> and to, to, when you get to the point where you don't know what to say because whatever you say is going to be a lie, why bother saying anything at all? Right. <laughs> you know, he sent the USS W. Bush back <coughs> to Iraq, but everything that we did, I did three tours in Iraq and one tour in Saudi Arabia, and everything that we did and all the friends I lost there, now that they, they went back and took Iraq City, what did we accomplish? Now that they, they recaptured, you know, Iraq City again, what, what are we going for? Now, President Obama is funding the same people that killed our soldiers. The same people that President Obama is supporting to kill his Syrian, the Syrian children, the, the Syrian people. But he's denying even having involvement in doing this. I mean, this is one of the main reasons why, you know, we need to stick together and stand up as a people not just Americans, but as a universal community to stand up and say, this has to stop. The lies has to stop. The public has to be made aware of these lies. You know, this administration has to go. It's enough. Enough people died, enough bloodshed. Children have to have a future in a world of peace. And it's time now that they have to be secured for their lives to be able to have that future. And for this to continue, it's, it's a shame. It's a crying shame. And it's not, it's not, it's criminal is what it is. And it, now is the time that we have to act. We're up, you know, we're, we're, we had our lives already. We lived now for our children to have a life. And if we don't give that life to our children, what future is there going to be? You know, and that's the shame. Uh, now, friends, we have to, um, we have a problem. Thank you. We, we have to be, finish this meeting in less than five minutes. So, there are four hands that, that I saw, but I'm going to ask each of you to keep it to less than a minute so that, you know, this is part of, we're all going to work together on this, right? So I see Kazim here. Uh, and, okay, and then this woman here, and then over there. Is that? Okay, in one minute, uh, we can talk about Syria 10 hours, and it's not enough. But uh, I just want to admire the Syrian government. Very often, the Syrian government was special. Let me tell you why. They never allied with the power to keep the power. They never allied with the United States in any tactical reason, for any reason, to defend Syria or to defend Palestinian. They always relied on the people. I wonder what we had with the Iranians. They told me they're going to the overthrow in one month, two months, four months. Some of them, they were good, they said two years. I dare say they were never able to throw, overthrow the US civilian government because it's united with the people and it's always defended the right. When the Arab fight with Iran with the support of the United States, Syrian defended Iran. They never, Iran, if you take that, the tactic of relying on the United States against some other third world country, they're going to lose themselves. I'm saying that as an Iranian. We should never rely on the United States to defeat a third world country. That United States should be out of Middle East, should be out of Iraq, out of everywhere in Middle East. Uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Nabil Abdel Al, and uh, now I'm short of time, and I try to make this very fast. Uh, you talked about the uh, American policies over the years with so many governments, so many administrations, and the end result is a uh, big loss, be that in Vietnam, Korea, Iraq, you name them. Um, I wonder when uh, 
will the American uh, government or administration pay heed to the big losses and the consequences? I don't have a panacea for that. Uh, my English English is not my mom's uh, tongue, and uh, uh, internally they try to hoodwink everybody into believing that externally they are trying to stem the weapons of mass destruction. At the same time, internally they are nourishing weapons of uh, misdirection. <laughs> they use, misuse, and confuse these terms intentionally. When we listen to words like war against terrorism and then against terror, I'm sure they know the difference because the only common denominator between terror and terrorism is that they share the same root, you know. Unless the end result is to, to, to terrorize some people and whatnot. There is a thin line between democracy and anarchy between confidence and confidentiality. Once upon a time, a little child asked his father, what is the difference between confidence and confidentiality? And the father looked at him and he said, you are my son, this is confidence. That child standing over there is also my son, and this is confidentiality. <laughs> uh, Thank you. You have to stop them. You have to make sure that they understand the accumulated impact of these systemic, systematic, seismic, seismic wars going on. And the only reason they go on, as Shakespeare put it in, I, you know, uh, we're, we're keeping this to a minute. As, <laughs> yes. Uh, as you like it, which I don't like it. <laughs> what is that? I'm trying to get the quote and it escapes me. Uh, sweet are the uses of adversity. Sweet are the uses of adversity. They are doing this because they can, uh, they can get away with it. They can get away with murder. And nobody gives a damn. Thank you very much. Joe and one minute. One minute. Okay, one, one minute. minute. Just one minute. I made one minute. a specific question for our friend, Dr. Jafari, from the heart. From the heart. First, my name is Sam Hajar, Syrian by birth, American, proud American by choice. I'm a physician practicing in Crozer River in the Hudson County. Microphone. Thank you. I am Syrian by birth, American by choice, and I'm proud and I'm a physician practicing in the Hudson County. Quick question to our friend, Dr. Jafari, from the heart without words, without any. If we take the uh, wars, all of them, across the history is finance interest. And when the United States went into Iraq, they were beating the drums of war, <coughs> weapons of mass destruction or single destruction, a dictator, he got his people, he did this. I said, this is all can be defended. What's the war there? Interest, oil, Saddam Hussein is sitting on 25% of the international reserve. So there's a reason there. And Jim Baker, he said, jobs, 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 money, money, money. We come to Syria, and I'm sure the United States can stop this war in one week. Can stop it. Can tell Turkey and everyone, sit down. <coughs> United States initiated this war, sustaining this war. We continue to stay now for years, and maybe 10 years, who knows? <coughs> What's the reason, United States, the real reason, deep inside your heart, your analysis, your experience, your wisdom, what's the main reason that United States started this war? Did the United, the, the, the Syrian government have free uh, monetary messages or, or, or some <coughs> letters from visiting dignitaries or US senators, do this, do this, or otherwise we'll do that, we'll do that. Did the, United, the Syrian government receive any messages or any warning about this war's coming? So how, this is the way we know what is this war all about, why the United States started it, and sustaining it. Dr. Jaffrey, please tell us from, from your heart. We're, we're going to give Ambassador Jaffrey the last word, but, but we had a couple of other people we called on, and then 
and and I'm going to hold you to 30 seconds. <laughs> so. Good luck fast. Um, hello, I'm Joe Lombardo. I'm the national co-coordinator of the United National Anti-War Coalition. Um, two members of the U.S. delegation were from our coalition, Joe Eisenbacher from Chicago and Judy Bellow, who had to catch a plane to go back home to Rochester, um, was also there. And Sarah is also, um, all three of them members of the uh, administrative committee of our organization. We understood that this election would be the biggest blow to the United States and its policies and U.S. imperialism in Syria because the Syrian people spoke and there is no basis. They tried to say that Assad was um, against his people and the people were against him and the people of Syria spoke and that is more powerful than any weapon that, that can happen. Now the U.S. is a very powerful country, but there's one thing that's more powerful than the United States government, and that's the United States people, and that's our job. Yes. And I just want to pledge to everybody here, and especially my friends from Syria, that we will continue to work to stop our government and not allow them to destroy this wonderful country, Syria, and we will build a movement that will stop them, and they know the power of this movement, that is why when they announced that they were going to bomb Syria, they all of a sudden started seeing, we called for demonstrations in 130 places around the country, demonstrations materialized, and they knew they had to back off because they didn't have the support of the one power that's greater than the U.S. government, and that's the U.S. people. We will continue to be by your side. People from every country in the world have the same needs, the same desires, and we will be by your side. Thank you. Um, I, I have heard about what, I agree with what's said about the U.S. government, but as I know you from the U.N. and have watched this whole thing at the United Nations for over a decade unfold against Syria, Iran, people in the region, the UN is not being an honest broker, and it's it's becoming very obvious. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's embarrassing to see the UN Secretary General and the UN just become like the front group for old colonial Western Europe, and you know those same people from Congress of Berlin. It's embarrassing. I, I mean, it's it's tragic, and it's it, but that being the case, um, what what are the there's no honest broker there. It's literally Syria against, in a sense, the world. So what is the possible outcome on that? We'll, we'll give the ambassador thank the you. last word on all of this and thank him. Thank you, thank you. So thank you Sarah. Thank you so much for, for uh, uh, the excellent way you have uh, managed the direction of this uh, nice evening. Actually, each one of the questions uh, you have raised, namely speaking, the last five questions, would require uh, an hours and hours to, to, to answer them. However, I guess, mainly speaking, that the beauty of the American values, the constitutional values, the founding fathers of America, these, the beauty of these values has transpired a couple months ago when the American public opinion, led by the, these very wise speakers, led the America, uh, 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 influenced the American administration to stop its plans to attack Syria. This is the real America we love. And this is the real America we, we, we are proud of. I always mentioned in my statements at the United Nations that the Syrian people are not the enemies of the American people. On the contrary, on the contrary, one million Syrians decided to migrate to USA. And they chose this country to become their country by choice, as Dr. said. So our problems with the, with the uh, American administrations are rather political. <coughs> the presidential candidate, the former one, Ross Perot, 
when they said something very interesting, very indicative and informative with regard to the American political life. He said, soccer has rules. Anything has rules, except politics. <coughs> politics in USA have no rules. And he, he is right. He is right. I don't want to interfere into the bipartisan system in USA and why there are not three parties or four parties or five parties. This is not my business. I'm a, I'm a guest in this country. So I would not comment on this uh, choice. But what I'm saying is that I think the American administration uh, is seeking, uh, due to the fact that, I mean, given that it is uh, a giant on this planet, a big power, is seeking geopolitical goals in its foreign policy. Syria, Iraq, Egypt, Palestine, Ukraine, you name it, even, even Pakistan, uh, we might be details in this geopolitical uh, uh, landscape. And we have to agree that we are a small country, Syria. Compared to USA, we are a small country and we are not seeking military confrontation with, US, with USA. We don't have this uh, aspiration or, or this uh, hidden agenda. Or, on the contrary, we would like USA to be deeply involved positively speaking, in solving the problems of the world. I'm telling you this because I, am, I know what I'm talking about. I have been ambassador uh, to my of my country to the United Nations for even seven, eight years so far. Two years before that, I was ambassador to Geneva, to the UN in Geneva. So 10 years working in the, at the United Nations on a daily basis, four hours with my colleagues, the, the Syrian diplomats. Sometimes we have the feeling that there is no United Nations. Mm -hmm. It's a circus. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have the feeling that this is a circus. Where is the international public, uh, where is the international law? Where is the charter, the provision of the charter of the United Nations? I will give you one example. It happened today. The Western group, Europe, <coughs> USA, Canada, Japan, Australia, submitted the candidacy of Israel to the post of vice chair of the fourth committee in the General Assembly. I know it's technical. Maybe some of you are not aware of that. The fourth committee deals mainly speaking with the issue of the Palestinian cause, <laughs> the Palestinian uh, occupied territory, UNRWA's activities for the Palestinian refugees, the Syrian Golan, this is what the fourth committee is about. So Europe and USA, Japan, Australia decided to submit the candidacy of Israel to the post of vice chair of this committee. And they won. This afternoon, they won. They got 67 votes, 76 abstentions, and I don't know how many in favor. What a scandal. What a scandal. Israel is chairing the fourth committee that deals with the Palestinian question. <coughs> Could you believe it? This is the UN. This is the UN of today. This is what we are suffering of every day. I can give you examples and examples and examples about the deterioration of this organization. Another example. Today we had a briefing at the, at the United Nations with this distinguished panelist. One hour. Of course, there were correspondences between the Syrian mission and the UN secretariat uh, about this event. Uh, we exchanged letters, emails, phones, everything was fine. And they asked my secretary, do you need webcast? We said, yes, we need webcast. We went there. Five hours after I started the introduction, they shut down the webcast. Five minutes. There is no record. They shut down the broadca broadcasting of the, uh, of the event. That, that never happens. 
we pay, we the Syrian people, we pay one million dollars every year to the budget of the United Nations. We are not here begging anybody. We pay every year one million dollars to the budget. It's our rights to be heard through the UN mechanisms. But they shut down the broadcasting so that nobody outside would follow on what's going on inside. So that nobody would hear the voice of these ge ladies and gentlemen about what they saw in Syria. It's, it's amazing. It's really amazing how <coughs> How, uh, uh, how immoral uh, uh, this United Nations has become. It's really amazing. I, I have been in this business for 35 years. 25 of them maybe spent at the United Nations here and in Geneva and elsewhere. I have never seen the UN like this before. Never. Never. So, uh, I'm sorry, I... I uh, why, why United States is doing that you, United States, uh, th there are many reasons, actually. There are many reasons. Some of them are domestic. Some of them are related to the, uh, the hegemony, the, the, the willingness of being hegemonical uh, all over the world. Uh, you know, there is an, an, an English saying that says, uh, power leads to corruption, but superpower corrupts. <coughs> so when you feel that you are invincible, you are a superman, when you have this feeling of being a superman, you make mistakes because you are a human being. You will never be able to fly. But you give yourself and the others the impression that you can fly and we cannot kill you with the bullets. So you invade Afghanistan, you invade Iraq, you invade Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, you name it, Libya, Korea, Cor Korea uh, uh, and then uh, why not Syria? It's, it's a psychological uh, uh, cycle of, of uh, you know, manipulation. Sometimes people manipulate themselves because they have wrong information about themselves. So there are many, many reasons, but in my humble opinion, our own problems in the area are related, mainly speaking, to what one of the speakers said, Israel. <coughs> Israel. USA is somehow seeking unconditionally to protect the Israeli uh, uh, wrong policies in, uh, in, in the area. Uh, there are many proofs to, to, I mean, many evidences about that to prove what, that what we are talking about is, is, uh, is right, but we don't have the time and, and maybe we'll talk about it uh, uh, in a different occasion. Uh, what, what I'm trying to say is that we are in favor of building bridges of understanding, respect, mutual respect between Syria and the United States. We are not seeking confrontation. Uh, uh, when uh, President Obama was about launching his military uh, aggression against us because of the so-called chemical issues, uh, uh, I was on CNN, I said, this is, this is wrong, this is wrong, we are not seeking military confrontation. Those who will die by the American cruise missiles would be Syrians only. There will be no put American boots on the ground. The victims will be only Syrians, only Syrians. The same thing, it's, it's, it's happening right now. Yesterday, two days ago, our military killed 15 Malaysians, terrorists from Malaysia, 15. Every day, our army kills Australians, Chechnyans, Algerians, Libyans, Saudis, Kuwaitis, Qataris, Turks. They are not Syrians. We are fighting terrorism on behalf of the whole world. And this is why some people in the West, the hypocrites, are happy with this because they are exporting all the garbage to us. <laughs> Let us export all this garbage to the Syrians where they will kill Syrians and be killed by the Syrians. So please, as long as you don't get back to America, it's fine. But once 
we see one of you in London or Paris or Brussels or Washington, then the story will change. And this is why they are speaking about them, because some of them sneaked out of Syria and got back. That was not the plan. The plan was that you go, you don't get back. It's one way ticket. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I wanted to address uh, uh, some of your very valid uh, points, but I'm proud of you, honestly speaking. I'm your brother. You said United National. National. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor. I'm in favor. I'm proud of you guys. Uh, uh, God bless the real America you are representing. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Clark. Thanks a lot, Mr. Clark. Clark, yes. I'm going to make one pledge to the ambassador. This UN press conference that was not broadcast, we need a campaign. Now, we have the tape. We have the video of that. We already have the link. And I think we will make a real struggle to see if we can't make it go viral. Because, you know, it's very important to know it was shut down, that it wasn't allowed to broadcast. And so... Only with me. And so this, this we want to spread the word and ask many, many people to post this, uh, this uh, today's press conference. I think that's the way to respond, to respond in a combative way. And thank you for everyone who came. Shukran Thanks. This is our hero today. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. Yes. Thanks uh, for everyone. I want to say to my country in our language, it's easier for me. I want to say to Syria, Arbun wa fala Syria, nahna maaki, amin dafa annik, utrabak ba mankhun, utahya jamhuriya al-arabiya Syria.